How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who bring good news, good news, announcing peace, proclaiming news of happiness. Our God reigns, 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 our God reigns. It was our sin and guilt that bruised and wounded him. It was our sin. That brought him down when we like sheep went gone astray our shepherd came and on his shoulders bore our shame 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 from the tomb he came with grace and majesty he's alive he is alive god loves us so see here his hands his feet his side yes we know he is alive you that if you are a member and have not gotten a chance to vote tonight on the Missions House Basement Project, there's still a few moments to do so right now, and Karen is still out there in the, in the lobby, and you can vote tonight uh, while she's out there, and we'll have the results then a little bit later this evening. Um, also, just a couple quick things. I just wanted to let you know that tonight we're going to be running things a little bit different um, here in uh, our service. It's one of the few services of the year that you can, uh, you can mark this on your calendar. This is a rarity that I plan to let you out early um, and going to preach very short and 
Um, and the reason that is, is as you know, I've got kids in Awanas, and Awanas tonight is the Derby night, and I want to be able to be there and watch my kids race my cars. I mean, their cars. Um, no, we worked a lot together on those and just had a good time with it. And so, uh, and I would like just to encourage you, if you enjoy going down and watching the kids race their cars, uh, it's always a fun time. Uh, and everybody is welcome when we dismiss out of here tonight to go on down and watch the, the remainder of the track, uh, the races down there. There's notes in your bulletin you can make note of. There's some important things you should, should be aware of. But what I'd like to do is just go ahead and pray, and then I'm going to actually go right into a, just a short devotional, and then we're going to go into our communion time together tonight. And so um, let's go ahead and we'll pray together this evening. Father, thank you for the opportunity uh, to gather in your house and uh, to be able to worship and to sing of your mighty power. Lord, I'm reminded as we sing that of Psalm 19, that the heavens declare your glory. The firmament shows your handiwork day unto day at her speech and night to night declares knowledge. And Lord, you have displayed your majestic hand all around us. And even now as the turn of the spring, we see just the creative order. And so God, we want to praise you for that tonight. And what a joy then to gather together, to sing, to worship, to fellowship. And I just pray that tonight as we even take some time to focus on communion the sacrifice of christ that made us united in christ lord i just i want to i pray that we would uh lord exalt your name i pray you with our time there and i pray for the the awana derby downstairs for the teens or even for the vote that's taking place as people have been voting throughout the night and as we move forward with that project if that be uh, approved god i pray that be a blessing to missionaries as a constant need for them as a place to base and to settle and to to be out and and just thank you for the opportunity thank you for the provision lord you've been uh, so gracious to us and as a church then to see the opportunity to give back to you thank you for a giving heartbeat of this church and i pray you'd help us to use those funds wisely Uh, lord for the furtherance of your kingdom for the glory of your name we thank you for this all and it's the name of christ we pray amen we're going to jump into just right now just into just a devotional thought um and I won't be long with that. Anytime you hear a preacher say that, don't believe them. Um, it's one of those rare lies that they will tell you that they won't be long. No, I really plan to be pretty short tonight with this. Um, just before we take of communion together and, uh, and do this, I, I wanted to just take a, a moment to give you just a thought out of Psalm 10. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to be there tonight. And... Um, some commentators actually uh, link Psalm 9 and Psalm 10. They believe that originally those two psalms were one because um, they, they are going to share some similar veins, some similar thoughts. Um, however, the original languages don't portray that. But both of those are going to share a running thread that, that, that God is sovereignly aware and acting on behalf of the poor the oppressed the fatherless and and so that theme is kind of carried through both psalm 9 and psalm 10 Um, in fact we're going to see the 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 poor mentioned in in psalm 9 we'll see it in verse 12 where it says when he avenges blood he remembers them he does not forget the cry of the humble and that word humble in the new king james and the king james is actually a word anav that means the poor the afflicted the weak Uh, those that are humbled we see it again in verse 18 of chapter 9 (coughs) for the needy shall not always be forgotten the expectation of the poor shall not perish forever we're going to see it in chapter 10 then in verse 12 arise O lord O god lift up your hand do not forget the humble Uh, then again in verse uh, uh, 17 of chapter 10 lord you have heard the desire of the humble you will prepare their heart you will cause your ear to hear and so we're we're seeing a similar vein uh, the concern the need of the poor and god having his heart tuned towards them and so but we're going to primarily focus on just psalm 10 i want to share with you two interesting conversations that i had in the, in the past few days that helped kind of geared some thoughts that i had towards this psalm um one of them happened in a recent meeting that I was having 
uh, with the board of Center County Orphan Care Alliance, which is now going to be Orphan Care Alliance as they are um, uh, changing their focus from just Center County to all of Pennsylvania and trying to, to help out churches in every county connect to the needs of the fatherless and to care for that. And so they want to connect and enable churches to care for them. And, and that task is, is messy. We, we sat in a couple hour meeting talking through this. Um, and there are so many needs for the fatherless children and, and seemingly sometimes it seems like not enough resources or homes to help with that. So many homes are affected in our county as we see it and around our state by, by drugs, generational abuse, broken homes and on and on. And I sometimes ask myself as I, as I sat in that meeting and have considered this cause and have been involved with this obviously as we foster and have been involved in foster care for several years I sometimes ask myself what did these children do what decisions did they make to cause them to be in such difficult situations and what did I do to be born into such a good and godly home I mean the, the environment that I grew up was a Christian home where, where my my parents were, were raising us to know the Lord and th there wasn't drugs there wasn't um, my dad out running around or different things it was a stable home and the answer is that is I had nothing to do with that there was nothing in and of myself and honestly for the little guys that we've had in our home nothing of them is was their decision in that they're they're humbled they're the fatherless and so it's clear though that God cares for the fatherless um, and and we see them mentioned 42 different times in the Old Testament alone, talking about God's instruction to care for the fatherless. That he's going to provide for the fatherless. He's going to defend the cause of the fatherless. He talks about that pure religion in the New Testament is to care for the needs of the fatherless. And so we see God's heart is to care for them. And we're going to see them mentioned two times in Psalm number 10. The other, the other conversation is similar, but from the aspect of the poor. My, uh, my daughter, Cameron, my second daughter, had the opportunity to go over to Tanzania uh, just three weeks ago, got back last Saturday. And um, this week we were having a conversation. I, I asked her, so what type of things did you learn from the trip? And, and um, you know, she was telling me about the different experiences and things that she saw and witnessed and got to be a part of. One of the things she said is she said, I was, I was surprised by the poverty. She was out in rural parts of Tanzania, not even in Arusha or a main city. And I looked up some statistics. I was curious to see, according to some different statistics that I read, the average annual income for a family in rural parts of Tanzania, this is annually, is $207.35. That's a monthly income of $17.25 per month that they live on that's to provide food clothing shelter everything out of that 1725 a month she shared with me that she met a little neighbor girl well she's a teenage neighbor girl to where my brother is missionary at and, and this girl would like to study nursing someday and, and she wants to come to the state so she could possibly study nursing at even like a pensacola christian college and cameron and i are talking about that i said now think about that. Her parents are making $207 a month or a year just to get a flight tickets over. That's, that's a dream that'll, you know, that's out of reach, it seems like, for that. And I again ask myself the question, what did she do to end up in such poverty? And what did I do or what did my daughter do in contrast to end up in America in which we have such affluence we have such availability of income and resources to us. And the answer was nothing. I did nothing to be born here. And that child did nothing to be born in Tanzania. It goes back to the sovereignty of God. It goes back to his plans and his working. And Psalm 10 then mentions, again, the poor two times. So both of these thoughts, I want to just kind of frame what I was thinking. Both of those conversations were in my mind as I began to study Psalm 10. And I was wrestling with those questions. And, um, and so the psalm is, to be, to be fair, the psalm is really dealing with the psalmist 
crying out for God to do something when the wicked oppress the poor, when the wicked oppress the, the, the fatherless and those things. But what I find and what I found greatly encouraging in this psalm was the awareness and the nearness of God. We don't have time to this evening to break out or delve into the generational sins or national sins or pagan rejection of God to provide possible causes of these conditions. But, but notice the, the strong question that starts out in Psalm 10 verse 1. Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? The wicked in his pride persecutes the poor. Let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. The psalmist is asking, God, why aren't you doing something in this situation? These poor are being oppressed and don't you see their need? Don't you see their plight? Why are you allowing the wicked to have their day and to oppress them? And then he carries on this questions as he's praying this out in Psalm 10 up through verse 11. And then notice verse 12 and on. It says, Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand. Do not forget the humble. Remember, that's the word for the, the poor, the afflicted. Why do the wicked renounce God? He has said in his heart, you will not require an account. In other words, God's not going to get me for this. But notice verses 14 and 15. But you have seen, for you observe trouble and grief to repay it by your hand. The helpless commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness until you find none. You notice here as he's, as he's exclaiming this, the point here is that, that God is keenly aware. As the psalmist is wrestling, why this, why, why this struggle? He acknowledges, God, you see. God, you observe. This isn't outside of, of God's, God's understanding. He's not distant. and Eventually, he will act. And so as the psalmist says in a happier mode in Psalm 46, he is a very present help in time of trouble. That God isn't removed. God isn't removed from the fatherless children. God is not removed from the poor in rural Tanzania out in Babadi. He knows them. He knows their situation. And he offers, here's the greatest thing. It may not always look the same in this temporal vein in which we live but he offers them the same ability to know God and have a relationship with him which is far better we sometimes in America tend to always equate that finances and materialism equates to goodness but that is nothing in contrast to knowing God and so what we begin to understand is God is aware of their needs. And then it says in verse 16, the Lord is king forever and ever. The nations have perished out of his hand. Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble or the, the, the poor. You will prepare their heart. You will cause your ear to hear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed. The man of the earth may oppress no more. And so he is supreme he is king he can do whatever he wants now i may not completely fully ever understand some of the reasons and the ways of god i may not ever fully understand why my my life as i grew up in in maryland and in america is very different and god chose me to be here rather than in babadi tanzania or, or in, in in somewhere in yemen or in wherever that might be but I understand that God is king forever. I understand that he is sovereign and his ways are perfect. And what is more is as you meditate on the character of God as revealed in scripture, he's compassionate towards the poor, towards the needy, towards the fatherless, the widow. He's not ambivalent to their cries. Their cries are just as much heard and maybe even more so than those who have less need. Do you, do you realize the attentive ear that God has towards them? That, that's a blessing. And, and so, so, anyway, so, so there's, we're seeing, seeing some things that are kind of like a, 
uh, maybe a light here as a, a silver lining to all that. So as I meditate on all this, I, I wrestled as did the psalmist here, and I came to a few conclusions. And let me just give these conclusions, and then we're going to wrap up this time and go into our communion time together. The first conclusion is my prayers for the poor and the fatherless are clearly heard and important to God. We ought to be moved to pray more for them. We ought to be praying for the fatherless. Fatherless in our community, the fatherless in our county, the fatherless in our state, the fatherless around our country and around the world. Do, do we pray for them? That is a prayer that God's ear is tuned to. So, so we ought to pray for that more, to pray for the poor more. The second conclusion I had is, although I don't know or understand all the ways and plans of God, I do know that He cares and is very aware and concerned for them. And so sometimes you look at the, the full spectrum and you think, man, it, it, there's just so much need. How can I meet all of that need? How can I fix this problem? Like that's, that's, our, that's our thinking as Americans. What can I do? How can I throw more money to this situation? How can I fix this problem? And we realize God is aware of it and He cares. He is, he is not absent in it. He's not missed it. God is involved. Thirdly then, is when I do help, when I do get involved in caring for the poor, when I do get involved in caring for the fatherless, I began to recognize I'm in harmony with the ways of God and His plans in helping. And then lastly, which will kind of even steer us in our thoughts towards communion tonight, although every earthly problem may not be solved in this life, I'm greatly encouraged that the greatest problem of sin has been paid for. Every person has the ability to be rich in Christ, to be a joint heir with Christ, to be a, fa a child of God who is a father to the fatherless, the Bible says in Psalm 62. So, so every child, e every person has that ability. He says, I want to give you the greater. I want to give you even greater than material, uh, material things that are going to be burnt up someday and gone. I want to give you me. I want to give you forgiveness of sins. I want to make you my child. I want to have a relationship with you. And it doesn't matter if you are raised in the backwoods of Babadi. It doesn't matter if, if, if you have a, are in a fatherless situation. God offers the same opportunity to every single individual. He says, I want you. You matter to me. I made you. You're special. You're precious to me. And what a great God. What a great God we serve. So, so to keep with my promise that I said earlier, I'm going to stop there. And, and I encourage you to just kind of get some thoughts on that tonight. Just a short meditation, kind of get your wheels turning. And just to give, anytime we can just extol the glory of God and His goodness, um, I'm for that. So, and as we then come again, that way in which we are all brought near is through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's through his death on the cross. And so we are partakers of that. We get to be receptors of that. And as we take some time then for a few moments tonight just to partake of communion together. Uh, what a joy to recognize God has brought us near through his son, Jesus Christ. And so let me ask the question, if, if anybody did not get a communion set, you can raise your hand and uh, Ben will get those out to anybody that did not um, we're going to take a few moments then to prepare and um, partake of these things together what a great time to remind ourselves and I, I appreciate at the Passover Seder that we just had a few uh, last Friday or two Fridays ago it, it, it helped us to understand that even the Passover meal there is like a dual emotion of, of a reverence and a thankfulness to what God has done for us. But there's also a joy. There's also levity that was involved in the Passover meal. How could that not be when we consider what Christ has done for us? There is a reverence that it was my sin that caused him. It was, it was through his stripes that I am healed. 
there's a reverence to that. There's a, I don't want to take that unworthily. I don't want to take that just haphazardly, casually. There's also a joy that comes to it. I'm now a child of God. I have a reason to rejoice, and he's coming back for me someday. And so there's a, a mixture of emotions that accompany the table there as we gather. So Paul, Paul gives us words and instruction on this. I want us to think on them. We'll take a moment of prayer together uh, while Lisa will pray or play the piano for us. Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 11, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. The Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread given thanks he broke it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me in the same manner he also took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the lord's death till he comes therefore whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. And let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner. Eats and drinks judgment to himself. Not discern the Lord's body. So what he's instructing for us is. And what we teach here is we welcome anyone who knows Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. You're welcome to partake. Uh, the, the, the Lord's table is here is, is not an an aspect of a reception of new grace. This isn't, this isn't salvific by taking of the table. But what is this? It's a testimony of grace that's already been applied. And that's why it's not referred to as we refer to it as a sacrament. It is an ordinance. It's ordained that we would do this until he comes, that we celebrate, that we remember. And so we, we, we welcome, if you are already a child of God, that you would partake with us as we do this in remembrance of what he's done for us and so there ought to be a time of just searching our hearts with that and so while lisa plays we're going to take a time just in that moment while she plays to have some personal introspection reflection and then i'm asked tyler our deacon if he would come and pray then for the elements after she plays Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the sacrifice that you made on our behalf. Even coming out of this past week with Easter Sunday, we just are remembered, reminded even more that uh, you died for our sins, and we're thankful for that. And we take up communion to uh, be reminded of that as well, and just to remember that you're coming and that uh, we're here for a purpose, and we're here to serve you. So we pray that we'd have that on our hearts as we 
go about our workplaces and the weeks that uh, the places that you take us that we remember that we're here for you and uh, our hands are in your service i pray this in jesus name The Bible says that in that Seder meal or in that Passover meal, uh, Christ took from the middle matzah, as uh, we learned the other day, and took that piece and broke it, uh, which symbolizes his body, and then later on brought it back out, and he said, I want you to partake of this. And he said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me, remembrance of Christ. In the same manner, it says he also took the cup. And he gave it a new, it, it was the cup of atonement, the cup of that sacrifice. And he gave it a new symbolic aspect to it that the cup will now reference him being that atonement. Um, him being the one who sacrificed for us. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, remembrance of Christ. I often think about that fourth cup, the cup of praise, that he had said to his disciples, I will not drink again of this cup of the, of the vine until I drink it with you in, the father, in my Father's kingdom. And we're still awaiting the fourth cup. We're still looking forward to that. And that's why he said, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. There, there's, a, there's still yet a greater rejoicing. There's still a greater praise that we're looking forward to. And we do this in remembrance. It reminds us of what we have, where we stand. But it also is a remembrance he's coming back someday. And we look forward to that. And so let me close this with prayer and then we'll go ahead and dismiss. And we would welcome and, and encourage anybody going downstairs for the rest of the derby father we do so thank you for loving us enough to send us the perfect passover lamb the one who was bruised for our iniquities the one who was chastised for our sins god we thank you that you laid on him the iniquity of us all father i pray then as we go out from here that there would be just a joy and rejoicing of that grace the abundance of grace in which we stand and has been poured out for us and also ex excited for when christ will soon return thank you for this time together thank you for being such a good god lord you've displayed it as we looked in psalm 10 in your care for the poor and for the fatherless you've displayed it in your care for us with jesus christ or we just want to say we love you and lord we adore you it's in christ's name we pray amen have a good rest of the week.